Welcome everybody to this Wellbeing of Women webinar, which is entitled Let's Talk Periods. So we're going to talk today very openly about an incredibly common problem. Most of the girls and women that I see as a gynecologist um, and obstetrician have about 12 menstrual periods a year for nearly 40 years of their life. So this is an incredibly common issue. It's part of normal life. And yet the subject has been surrounded by mystery and taboo and embarrassment. And what this webinar is really trying to set out to do is to try and dispel some of those myths and the embarrassment and the taboo and make everybody who's joined us on this platform today appreciate how incredibly normal having periods are and that so many women's lives are affected by problems that they have with their periods. And so many women don't even realize that there are very simple steps that they can take and simple measures that they could implement to improve their lives, both at work uh, and at home with their families. It's an enormous pleasure to welcome our two super panelists, um, both experts in their field, Dr. Varsha Jain and Dr. Shujata Gupta. I think it's a measure of how problematic this topic is, this very, very common topic or very common issue, that we found it almost impossible to recruit a patient because when we run these WOW webinars, we like to have a patient voice to start it off. And although my uh, mailbox um, and my uh, Twitter are often beleaguered by women telling me about how terrible their periods are and how it's really interfering with their life, when we tried to identify someone who would come onto this open platform and talk about it, uh, we found that they were really just too embarrassed. So it's even more important that we run webinars like this so that we can normalize this important part of women's lives because without menstrual periods, as we're going to hear, it would be incredibly difficult for us to evolve as a species. Uh, we wouldn't have the fertility that we've got. Um, and I think it's really, really valuable for us all to know. Now, I understand that we have some gentlemen on the platform and I want to make a particular call out to them and say how welcome you are, because I think we want to make the issue about menstrual periods everybody's business. It's not just a woman's issue, it's everybody's business. And I really appreciate you taking the time and trouble to join us today. Uh, and I hope that you will ask us questions uh, when we come to the chat uh, towards the end. So without any further ado, I'm going to pass over to Varsha now, who before um, making her presentation, she's going to share with us some patient stories that I believe that she's collected from some of the research midwives that have worked and, and nurses that have worked with her uh, on a project when she was uh, in Edinburgh. So Varsha, I'm going to leave you to explain how you got hold of the stories, um, but I just want to emphasize again to our audience how appreciative we are that you've come to join us today, how common this issue is, and how we've got to ensure that the next time we run a seminar or a webinar about entitled Let's Talk Periods, that we are inundated with patient stories because they want to come and share their stories with us uh, in person on the screen. So Varsha, over to you and thank you so much. Absolutely, thank you. And thank you to Wellbeing of Women uh, for giving me this opportunity to talk about this incredibly important topic. So um, as uh, Professor Reagan has just mentioned, it's been extremely difficult to get hold of a patient to talk about their periods. Um, and particularly, I think that's because it's a webinar, people can see their face and there's a huge amount of embarrassment. So the research nurses who have worked with Professor Hilary Critchley in the University of Edinburgh over the last 15 to 20 years have a huge amount of experience of working with women who are recruited to studies and all these women have heavy menstrual bleeding. And quite often the patients get recruited in the clinic room with the doctor and then they'll go off to another side room with the research nurses and really sort of divulge information about how that heavy period or bleeding has been impacting them. So I've got sort of eight case studies and just a little quick summary of um, how those women have been affected. So the first woman is a, um, a lady who was a chef on a train. She used to work on long journeys, have early starts of the day, these really long days. And she'd have to wear Inco pads. So Inco pads are the sheets that you put on the hospital bed to soak up as much food as possible that we have and she'd wear two of those there weren't any um, loo facilities that she could use and really her job was too busy so she couldn't go to the loo to change um, and so she would flood so her bleed through her clothes onto the floor of the train and she said this resembled 
literally what would look like a crime scene uh, because she wasn't able to change, she wasn't able to wash, she'd just get on with things and she actually thought this was normal. So the second lady um, worked in a male dominated job, so in the construction industry. Again, she'd have to work with various workers. She worked in the management side of things, but she dreaded the start of her period. She had no pattern to when she would start bleeding. There was no warning. And really there were only mobile uh, lavatory facilities uh, within her working environment. So she couldn't change, she couldn't wash. And so what would happen is that she'd have to carry a change of clothes with her. She'd have to carry her sanitary products. But quite often men in the office would have to tell her that she'd leaked through her clothes because she was unaware and this was hugely embarrassing for her and quite upsetting. It made her lose her confidence um, and she'd literally sit on in the car crying after these episodes. Um, also, we had quite a high profile medication that was stopped last year for various reasons and that caused her to stop her period. So it gave her that quality of life back. However, when we couldn't prescribe that to her anymore, she literally cried down the phone for half an hour because she just lost that any element of quality of life that she had gained back with that medication. The next lady, um, she'd have to travel on the bus to go to work and she'd have episodes where she'd just flood onto the seats of the bus. So she'd carry a towel with her so she could put the towel down so she wasn't staining the seat. But quite often she'd have to just get off the bus early and leave a stained seat behind and then turn up to the workplace with stained clothes before she'd then be able to go to the toilets to change or wash again. And then we had another lady who was in the management side of things. So you imagine that she's having heavy periods. She's having to stand up at meetings and do presentations. But she said quite often I'd be caught out where I'd stand up and the seat would be bloody. My clothes would be ruined. She'd actually ha um, been having prescribed anxiety medications due to her erratic cycle and the terror. Literally, these are her words, the terror of flooding in front of her workmates. Now, the next lady was a teacher and she would have episodes of flooding while teaching her primary school children class. She was unable to leave the class or the room um, to change her sanitary products because she can't leave the children alone. And she'd continue on teaching um, and wait for the bell to ring so that the class would empty. She'd be able to go to her locker and to the staff toilets to change. The facilities were really poor, so she wasn't able to wash and quite often those staff facilities were both male and female. Um, and so everybody knew what was going on. Um, and she just, she said she felt ashamed of what was happening in her body. And then this is something that um, also hits home as well, is that a lady was saying that her marriage was under great amount of stress because of the episodes of flooding at night. So what would happen is that her husband would be disturbed because the bedding would need to be stripped completely. She said she'd gone through so many mattresses at home because they'd been ruined by heavy bleeding, despite having waterproof sheets and towels on the bed. So her husband's sleep was being disturbed. His work was being disturbed. Her work was being disturbed. It was affecting how they were dealing with their children. And quite importantly, it was affecting their sexual relationship. And this is something that quite a lot of women talk about is that it affects the stress in their marriage due to erratic bleeding, but it also means no sex as well. And then in terms, in terms of pastimes and hobbies, um, a lady would enjoy hill climbing um, with her husband and friends, but she was struggling to keep up with this. This is something I'll go into in my presentation, is that 30% of women who have heavy menstrual bleeding are actually anemic. And this lady is an example of this, where the heavy menstrual bleeding had caused her to be so anemic that actually her symptoms were causing her to be breathless. So she wasn't able to take part in hill climbing. Um, and actually, when she took part in one of our studies, we actually measured her bleeding amount by weighing her pads and towels. She was actually bleeding one litre every month. That's, that's absolutely shocking. That's a huge amount. Um, and when she came into hospital, her blood count was so low that she needed blood transfusions and she actually ended up having a hysterectomy. And then if you go on to the rest of your family life, so ladies are stressed about how heavy bleeding affects family holidays and they would try and only book their family holidays out with their period. But that's fine if your period is regular, but quite often a lot of our patients, their periods are so erratic that they will just get caught out. So they think about the, and they speak about the horror of being caught out in their swimming costume or episodes of flooding on the beach and holidays being ruined 
due to the pain and the bleeding. The fact that they can't wear white trousers on holiday or light colours or pretty dresses because it's just so unpredictable, um, but also the discomfort that's caused with that. And bleeding doesn't affect just patients out there and we're doctors in here. We've had consultants and doctors in the hospital who say they work on a very busy understaffed ward and they're unable to change their sanitary products because they, when they experience flooding as well. So this is, this is affecting everyone. So periods and heavy periods are something that we don't talk about, but it's not until the patients give us insight into what's happening that we can actually really realize how abnormal um, and how impactful they are. They do always mention that they feel that they're not listened to by their GP, that they're brushed aside, um, and they have a certain element of joy when they are listened to, when people finally are taking them seriously. But I think if we can really highlight from this webinar that actually, I think it's everybody's responsibility and everybody's duty that when a woman does talk about how periods are affecting her, that we do take that seriously. Um, and I'm not sure, Prof, if I should just go into my slides now, but if I, I'm going to explain really what's normal with a period and then how we can really think about what's abnormal as well. Lovely, Varsha. So thank you for sharing those, um, those excerpts from real, 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 real life people, real life women. Absolutely. And they really are shocking, aren't they? So, um, uh, and I hope that all of our audience will appreciate quite what an enormous issue this is and why we've really got to demystify it and crack it. So you're now on to your presentation. So what we've asked Varsha to do is explain to us all about what periods are, uh, what does normal mean? Normal may mean different things for different people, but she's going to give us a range um, and she's going to talk about all the various problems that women can experience. Now, she's going to do all that in the space of about 10 minutes, which is quite an ask. So uh, <laughs> over to you and I'll stop chatting. Over to you. Thank you. Great. So when we're, when we're talking, this whole webinar is Let's Talk Periods. Um, I actually normally end my presentations with this infographic, but I wanted to start with it today because I was thinking before this talk, how do we actually start normalizing the conversation? Um, how do we get people talking about it? I was aware that there were going to be men and women on this talk. So how does how would I get my brothers to start talking about periods? And I think the first thing really is if you have ever used any of these euphemisms, um, I would just ask you to stop. Let's just call periods periods. Let's just call them what they are um, and try and avoid these euphemisms. And when we think about euphemisms, actually, um, um, we'll go on to um, looking at how many euphemisms there really are. But I would ask the question in the audience, do you really feel comfortable talking about periods? And that's not just with your really close friends or really close family. This is with anybody like grandparents or um, colleagues at work. If someone was to open up about their periods, would you feel comfortable to continue that conversation on? Do you know what a normal period is? Um, it's really easy to say that when we were in school, the biology lessons that we had would tell us that a woman has a period every 28 days and it lasts for seven days. But is that the limit of normal? Is there anything else in between? And we'll talk about that as well. And finally, how common are period problems? So obviously, Professor Reagan has said this is affecting a huge number of women. It's extremely common. But what does that actually mean? And I'll, I'll try and share with you how common this actually is of a problem. So a study um, done a few years ago, which um, looked at 90,000 people from 190 countries around the world, actually found there were over 5,000 slang terms or euphemisms for the word period. Um, and obviously I had a selection on my first slide, but really there are so many in so many different languages. Um, and like I said, we do just need to stop calling periods by any other name, we just need to call them periods. And last year, at the beginning of last year, the Scottish government um, aimed a campaign at 16 to 24 year olds to call periods periods. And I think this is trying to sort of tackle the stigma and taboo around periods. But I would say that webinars like this, work that well-being of women are doing, work that you sort of, we hear that people are doing sort of on the internet, on the radio, it's really important that all of us actually get this message and take this message home that we do need to stop call, calling periods by their, their other names. Now, I just wanted to recap the menstrual cycle just so that we know exactly what we're talking about. We're all on the same page. When I say period, when you say period, we're actually know, knowing that we're talking about the same thing. So this is sort of back to biology lesson um, that we used to have at school. So when is the start of a period? So the start of a period 
is the very first day that that person is bleeding. Um, that person bleeds, the lining of the womb will shed, so over here on the left-hand side, and then the lining of the womb, so the endometrium, will go through a cycle. Now, I've put 28 days, I'll go through what's normal, but let's just say on average it's 28 days. So in the first 14 days, um, what's happening is when um, a female baby is born, she is born with all of the eggs that she ever needs in her whole life. Every single month once she starts her periods, one of those eggs is um, selected, it becomes a dominant follicle, and that egg is released to ovulation. So we've all heard of that term ovulation. But what's happening in the lining of the womb? So during that phase, lining of the womb is under the response of estrogen, and it's building up and becoming nice and thick. Then once that egg is released, um, the shell of the egg is left behind, and that's called the corpus luteum. That produces lots of progesterone. That's the second hormone that we're talking about. Um, that progesterone in combination with the estrogen, it's in a fine balance, causes the cells of the lining of the womb to decidualize. So that means they change in shape um, and form. Um, they start secreting lots of good juices um, just so that endometrium, so the lining of the womb, is ready to accept a pregnancy. If that pregnancy doesn't exist, doesn't, um, there's no fertilization, the pregnancy doesn't embed in the lining of the womb, then we get to a stage where the progesterone is withdrawn. So there's a lack of progesterone because that corpus luteum withers away. Um, and then that endometrium, so the lining of the womb becomes really fragile and starts breaking away and sheds. And that's what menstruation is. So all of these blood vessels at the bottom that are in the lining of the womb, those start bleeding. And eventually through a process of repair, um, they start healing. And again, you start this cycle all over again. So what's happening when a woman has heavy bleeding? So she could either be bleeding for a much longer time period, so right up until ovulation. Um, so she's bleeding for half of the month. It could be that she bleeds and then has another period in between her cycle. And then, so she's having two periods every month. Or it could be that there's just no pattern whatsoever and she's bleeding intermittently throughout the month. So she's just got no pattern. And really, we don't actually know why this is happening. So what's actually going on in the endometrium, in the lining of the womb to cause this to happen? We know there's a very fine balance between estrogen and progesterone, but we think there's a number of other things that are going on. We do need a lot more research in order to understand this. Now, why am I talking about heavy bleeding? Why am I researching it in my PhD? Why are Wellbeing of Women funding me to research this? And it's because one in three women are affected at some point in their reproductive years by heavy menstrual bleeding. So at some point they will be impacted. It's the fourth most common thing, the most common reason why women are referred to gynecology services. And in England and Wales alone, over 1.5 million women are affected by this condition. Now that's a statistic from 2011, so that's 10 years old. And I can guarantee you that number is much higher because I, I guarantee you so many women just aren't even talking about it. Um, we know that in the NHS, Drugs just aren't specific, and especially for heavy menstrual bleeding, we don't have any specific targeted drugs to affect to, to have an impact on this problem. And so what happens is women are ending up being dissatisfied by medical treatments they're being given. And so a third of our patients are having to resort to hysterectomy. That's radical, radical um, treatment measures. So overall, this heavy menstrual bleeding is causing women to have problems with mental health. So 50% of women who have heavy menstrual bleeding say that their bleeding problems are causing them to have anxiety and depression. And this is exacerbated by the social isolation that they feel by having the heavy bleeding. Heavy bleeding also impacts their physical health as well. So a third of women who have abnormal uterine bleeding actually present because of their anemia symptoms. So that could be shortness of breath, tiredness, fatigue, unable to concentrate. Um, all of these problems, breathlessness that we've already mentioned with our hill climbing patient initially. Um, so it's a huge, huge issue. Women who have heavy menstrual bleeding are also probably more likely to encounter miscarriages. They're more likely to have problems with their fertility. Um, and really, if you can think about the patient stories that I told you, heavy menstrual bleeding really affects women in the workplace. So either they're not able to get to the workplace, so the woman on the bus who just can't maybe tolerate an hour journey to work because she's just flooding through so she's not able to leave the house or actually women when they do get to work 
they're not able to concentrate because they're constantly toilet mapping or trying to think about where they need to go or how they will change or wash. So heavy menstrual bleeding really affects all of society. And I've tried to highlight with that with the patient stories at the beginning. And even though it might not be life threatening, it really is life altering. Now we talk about what's normal, what's common. People say, okay, well, um, so many women have period problems. We, we must know that they're normal. Well, actually this is what's normal. So again, that textbook definition of every 28 days, bleeding for seven days, actually there's a variance within that. So a period cycle, so bleeding from the first day of one cycle to the first day of the next cycle can be anywhere between 24 to 38 days. And it can last anything up to eight days actually. Um, and then when we talk about the regularity, we can have a difference between cycle. It don't always have to be 28 days or 30 days. There can be a variance of seven to nine days between the shortest and the longest cycle, if you were to map those cycles. Now, what's really important here is a flow volume. That has to be normal for the patient. If that patient is having to think, right, I can't wear white trousers today, I can't leave the house today, or I'm thinking I'm gonna flood, so I'm gonna have to wear double protection, all of these things are abnormal. What that means is that woman should be going to her GP saying, I have heavy periods, I need to be referred to a gynecologist or I need some medication or investigation to understand why I'm bleeding heavily and I need some solution or some, some sort of treatment for this. And when we talk about common, um, this is a great graphic that um, the RCOG have produced and it's really talking about, well, what is common, what is not common? So we've already said that heavy bleeding affects one in three women. That's a person in a family. So it's a very common problem, but it also means that everybody on this call probably knows someone that's affected by heavy bleeding. But I wonder if you've had those conversations with that person about that heavy bleeding, or would they feel comfortable talking to you about the problems that they are having, or you're dealing with those problems yourself. So I think it's being open that these problems are probably affecting somebody or another in your life. Um, and it's how can you go about doing that and making that a normal conversation so that we can help these women. And really what causes heavy menstrual bleeding? So this is a graphic of the womb and they've sort of tried to depict everything that's going on with the with heavy menstrual bleeding. And really, I just wanted to say that there could be problems inside the womb. So a growth in the womb, for example, fibroids, um, or it could be a problem that's going on within the body. So these are non-structural causes. So maybe there'd be a problem with the bleeding um, system within the body. So a woman's not able to clot properly. So therefore she's not able to heal that endometrium and therefore um, uh, she's not able to stop bleeding and therefore she just keeps on bleeding. So it's really important when a woman has heavy bleeding, she goes to the GP, we try and understand exactly what's causing her heavy menstrual bleeding before we then start down the journey of understanding how we can treat that. Because without understanding the cause, we really can't target the treatment. And I think that's one of the questions that had come from the audience as well, that a patient had to go to A&E because she was bleeding so heavily. It's not actually the physical quantity or amount of blood that a patient's bleeding. So if that is affecting her, then it does warrant a referral to gynecology to understand what is going on. So these are everyone who's helped me with my research and my work as I continue on. Um, and I'll pass back to Professor Reagan now. Lovely. Thank you very much indeed, Vash. That's really helpful. And I love the infographics because I always think that an infographic replaces umpteen slides of text. So thank you so much for that. I think what we're going to do now is to go on to Sujata's presentation. And then after she's presented, we can then address some of the questions and open up the debate uh, from the chat and for, from other questions that we've been sent over. So thank you, Sujata. The platform is all yours. And we're really looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Regan. And thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, so I work as a consultant gynecologist in Manchester and I've I've been doing gynecology for almost 20 years and I would like to share my experience and some of my patient stories which I remember uh, even after having seen them and treated them for many many years and the aim of sharing this with all of you today is to hopefully emphasize what are the things you should all be watching out for and when to ask for help. So with that I would like to start by talking about a 16 year old patient of mine. And I remember her extremely well because by the time she was referred to me, it had been two years of 
extremely painful periods for her. So she had extremely painful periods from the age of about 13, 14. She'd seen her GP numerous times and every time it was told that it's normal to have some pain uh, during periods and the most she was offered was some painkillers. And this young girl, she had missed um, days and days of her school. She'd missed out on socializing with her friends. And, and essentially what I remember the most about her was the fact that she felt there was something wrong with her in that she wasn't able to deal with periods like her friends. Um, and interestingly, after two years, she then had a pelvic ultrasound scan. And, and I've put in a picture and I'll explain to you what this picture shows. So when she came to me, essentially her diagnosis had more or less been made because on ultrasound scan, what we thought was she possibly had an ovarian cyst. So she was referred to me with the scan report saying this young girl has possibly an ovarian cyst with some, some blood collection in it. And, and hence the reason to refer her to me. Now the scan was a bit unclear, so I asked for a further scan in the form of an MRI scan, which then clarified that this young girl had a, an anomaly in how her uterus was formed, which led to a small cavity, which was part of her uterus, which had collection of blood inside, which had no way of coming out with the normal periods. So I, so just to look at the diagram, you can see that on, on this side, you, there is the uterine cavity where when the period occurs, the blood is able to come out through the cervix, through the vagina. But there's a small blind pouch within the cavity where the bleeding happens with every period, but there's no, no way of blood coming out of this cavity and and no no wonder she was in such a lot of pain and these are some pictures of laparoscopy which is a camera through her belly button uh, which was a procedure done under general anesthetic and this is the normal uterus and this is what we would say a rudimentary horn so the blind cavity with blood collected inside all this young girl needed was removal of this this cavity um, and this was done as day case. She was discharged home the same day. I saw her three months after her surgery. Symptoms had completely gone. She was a new person. So, so I, the reason I'm putting these stories is because I think we could have got to this diagnosis a lot sooner if we had taken her concerns, taken note of the fact that her symptoms, her pain was out of proportion for what we would expect and if she'd had an earlier ultrasound scan. So the last bit I would make mention is ultrasound scans don't always pick up conditions like endometriosis. So if you have that amount of pain, please ask to see a gynecologist. The next patient, is a is a patient who when she saw me she was 40 years of age but she'd seen her gp a couple of years prior to that with significantly heavy periods and at the time her gp had arranged a scan for her which showed a, a, a small fibroid um, which measured about six by seven centimeters so fibroids are incredibly common they are benign growths on um on the muscle of the womb and uh, and and they're very, very common. With fibroids, what matters is what symptoms they are causing, what, what size they are, they are, how many and where they are. But since, since the GP had found that there was a fibroid, she was then referred to a gynecologist. And at that point, this patient had uh, not really tried to have a baby. So the gynecologist, uh, gynecologist advised, go and try for a baby. And, uh, and if you don't get pregnant within a year, then you, we will refer you for IVF, which is what happened. So she didn't conceive. She was then referred for IVF. She had two failed cycles of IVF. Um, and after that, she essentially gave up um, trying to conceive. The problem with periods carried on. Um, and, and at this point, she saw me to say, I know I'm not going to have a baby. Can, can you do something to help me with the, with the bleeding? So for this patient, although she was 40 and she's, she'd said she'd given up, we decided that doing a hysterectomy would be taking that chance of having a baby away from her 
permanently. So at this point, uh, we decided that we should remove the fibroid and preserve her womb. The fibroid was small enough to be done to be removed through keyhole, which is a laparoscopic myomectomy. Um, and, and surgery went uncomplicated, patient was discharged home. And then six months later, um, I received a card and eventually the patient came to see me with a beautiful little boy. Um, and you know, it's just, it's one of the things, one of the cases I remember, because I just think that she'd given up all hope of having a baby and essentially had come to me thinking she'll have a hysterectomy. So, so take home message, I think fibroids are very common. Um, and I think if you are one of those patients who has fibroids and heavy periods, have a conversation with your gynecologist. Don't be afraid of asking questions. Where are my fibroids? How many are there? What treatment options have I got? Can we go through all of them? Um, you know, don't just walk away with go away and do nothing about it without asking those questions. Sometimes it might be the right thing to do that, you know, don't do anything about it, but do ask those questions. And the last patient I would like to talk about is a 48-year-old lady who um, saw me because of heavy periods, pretty much like what Varsha said. So, you know, this lady was a CEO of a big IT firm. She needed to manage a lot of people, speak to a lot of people, and she was, you know, flooding and embarrassment. And the other thing uh, this patient had was um, perimenopausal symptoms. So at her age, she was bleeding more than ever. Her periods, her cycles had, had become shorter um, and she had hot flushes and brain fogging so saying that suddenly she she was lost for what what she was about to say um, to a, a boardroom full of people and otherwise fit and healthy and just essentially this is not me um, I remember she would always come wearing black clothes because of all the problems she was having. And she'd had a scan which showed significant thickening to the lining of the womb. So with her presentation of heavy and irregular bleeding and significant thickening of the lining of the womb, which may be suggestive of a polyp or a pre-cancer change or a cancer change, she had a camera test into her womb, which is called hysteroscopy and a biopsy from the lining of the womb, which was normal, which was normal and reassuring. So I could assure her it's not cancer, it's not pre-cancer. However, this is something that we often refer to as dysfunctional uterine bleeding, which is common in this age group. So, uh, so I would, I've not said it in my slide, but I think if you could take home one message from today's talk, is that always ask for a diagnosis. Why am I bleeding so heavily? You know, heavy, heavy periods is not a diagnosis. Menorrhagia is not a diagnosis. So for this woman, it was dysfunctional uterine bleeding. We talked about option which would fit in with her heavy bleeding and also with her perimenopausal symptoms. Um, and we, we agreed to try Myrina coil, which is a coil with progesterone, which keeps the lining of the womb thin along with some estrogen HRT. Her bleedings completely stopped. Her perimenopausal symptoms have almost disappeared. And, and again, all problems are solved without any major intervention like hysterectomy, all of this done in outpatient. So, so in summary, I hope from my you know, snapshot of my, my clinical uh, experience, I would say if you have irregular periods for more than three months, then this must be investigated, either by an ultrasound scan or a hysteroscopy. Um, if your bleeding or pain interferes with your quality of life, it stops you from doing what you would normally do, what you would normally wear, then it must be investigated and treated. So, you know, because you say so without any test, I would take your word as yes, your periods are a problem to you, let's look into it. Any abnormal swelling or pressure on your tummy, because sometimes big fibroids may not cause, cause period problems, but you may start to feel a lump or fullness in your tummy, so you must see your doctor. And if your doctor suggested a treatment to you and that doesn't help within three to six months, then you must be reviewed. And I, in, in my opinion as a gynecologist, I think 
ultrasound scan is a, a relatively non-invasive, simple, inexpens inexpensive investigation. So I think it should be done early on. And I would finish with this slide. Uh, on one side is a picture of pads and tampons, etc., cetera, et cetera. On the other side is just a cartoon of children. You know, Phineas and Ferbs was my children's favorite when I made this presentation. But essentially, all it is is my periods are heavy because I say so. And I think that's extremely important. So if you feel your periods are not right, because you know what is normal for you, um, see you, doctor. Uh, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sujata. That was great. So two presentations with uh, some real food for thought, I think, there. Really great. And I'm just going to pick up a few of the questions that have come up in the chat. Um, there was a question about um, um, what one lady has been prescribed tranexamic acid to help with recent heavy bleeding changes to her periods. And she's asking, is it a usual form of treatment? Yes, it is. And one gram four times a day can really work miracles during the bleeding phase of your cycle. And I'm glad to hear, Megan, that it's helped you a lot. So carry on taking them. I'm often asked by patients, well, is there a limit to how many tranexamic or methanamic acid tablets, which often are very helpful with pain and cramping uterine pain or wound pain? You know, there's no limit to that. You're not going to overdose on them. Um, and uh, it's probably best to limit taking the tablets to when you're actually having the period. But in my experience, if I ask ladies to take either tranexamic acid or methanamic acid, I always say to them, if you know when the period's going to come, start taking it, you know, as you anticipate it starting, because then often you can get ahead of, head with the pain or the discomfort or the reduced bleeding. Lots of questions about polycystic ovary syndrome and, um, how it can result in abnormal periods, irregular periods, even absent periods or heavy periods. Um, Varsha, do you want to make a few comments about that, about uh, PCOS and, and how variable the presentation can be or any aspect that you'd like to raise with us with your expertise? Yeah, I think so with PCOS, um, PCOS can present in a number of ways. And I think it's Maureen who's been talking about that um, and providing some um, information on PCOS. Um, PCOS, because it affects um, the ovaries, um, I was talking about the estrogen and progesterone production. So it is um, uh, one of the causes that causes a problem. So the ovulatory aspect of heavy menstrual bleeding, it can be a reason why a woman can have heavy bleeding. But women may not know they have PCOS until they maybe try for a baby or their periods don't turn up um, for a few months or their cycle becomes really irregular um, or they start having spots um, or excess hair growth. So I think PCOS is quite um, a, a, an interesting condition in that it can present in a number of different ways. I think there were some comments as well that um, they feel that patients don't get any aftercare when they have PCOS. And I think PCOS is one of those conditions where it's probably there with the patient for a number of years. And so I think as it changes with the patient's life, I think it's important that patient goes back to the GP and says, right, I need help with fertility or I need some help with my periods now. It's important to remember that you can't just diagnose a patient with PCOS or in fact heavy periods and just leave them be. It's that, it's that condition that needs um, constant attention. Um, so you can't become complacent with that. And I think. Thanks. And there's quite a lot of questions um, and, and, and lots of compliments to our speakers. So I must congratulate you again, Varsha and Sujata. But a lot of the ladies on the panel today, uh, on the question, on the chat rather, saying, you know, that they were pushed away by their GPs and told, you know, who just weren't interested. So I think it's important um, to go back to your last slide, Sujata, that, you know, yes, if you think that these are troublesome, then you're, I'm sure you're right, because they're troubling you, and that you really do warrant some investigation. So the one of the questions is, um, can a patient um, make an appointment with a gynecologist or do they have to go through their GP? Well, that's one of the, you know, that's one of the contentious issues, I think, at the moment. Currently, we have a system whereby the general practitioner or the family doctor is effectively the gatekeeper to secondary care services. But I think more and more now, 
we're, oh, I'm sorry, my ear pods keep falling out and I'm only putting them in just in case the ambulances at the hospital start screaming. Um, but um, sorry, getting back to my point, um, I think it's more and more we're trying to find ways in which we can set up women's one-stop clinics in communities where women are able to go and sort out their heavy periods, their contraception or their hormone replacement therapy and get their smears done, etc., etc. So I think it would save so much time and then so much um, expense as well if they could go to a one-stop clinic and get everything sorted out so at the moment the answer is if you want to go to a gynecologist directly you'll probably have to organize that um, privately but we are pushing um, the department of health um, to try and organize women's health hubs where not every general practice will have expertise in women's health but some in your area should so that women won't have to go go to multiple different appointments to get what are really very simple solutions so keep pushing um, and if you were put away or sent away last time you went to your gp or to the practice nurse and told oh just get on with it that's your period that's that's your problem then go back again and keep saying i must have an appointment and one of the things i think that um, perhaps i'll be shot for saying this but one of the things that i think that most family clinicians will respond to is if you talk about bleeding in between periods as well so that might be a trigger to get you referred on if you've met a bit of resistance but that's a bit naughty of me to say that but i i know that um, i know that that's a fact that they will want to exclude things too um, and there's a lot of quite a few comments as well um, talking about how um, when, you're, when you've got problems with heavy bleeding and fibroids, and thank you to Sharon Shear for, for putting this up, um, they're given a range of uh, options of, of, and, and how does one uh, decide what's right for you? And I think that is difficult, but one of the things that I'm really hoping that wellbeing of women are going to help women with over the next few years as we grow our portfolio is really first class um, patient information so how you can interpret these things so I think we, we're aiming to get to a point where doctors and nurses don't tell women what to do what doctors and nurses provide them with is the information they need to make the right decisions for themselves but can I come back to Sujata and Varsha to add into that so it's not just my voice talking yeah so I, I think um, if I can just add into that as well um, so um, that comment about being given so many options I think it's also just to highlight and this is quite close to home with my PhD that I'm doing currently is that there are a lot of treatments but at the moment gynecologists do just have essentially a shopping list that we have to offer patients um, and we can't predict that this treatment treatment A will particularly be suitable for patient X um, there's no way of knowing and I think that just highlights the work that well-being of women are doing that actually we do need more research into this area and to follow on from what Prof Reagan has said until we go and talk to the GP and say we've got problems with our periods and until we mention it again and again and again I don't think people are going to take notice and I think we have to demand those referrals to gynecology we have to say that this needs to be talked about because I think until we do that and not being fobbed off and not being pushed away um, and then that interest in that research will also come about that those advances are needed that we do need more medication we do need more treatment options that are available we do need to preserve women's fertility um, so we can't just resort to a hysterectomy um, so I think it's it's understanding that actually there is so much to be done in this field um, and well-being of women are starting on that track and we just need to keep supporting them doing what they're doing yeah thank you Sujata yeah I think you know access to gynecologist whether every woman should have a direct access to a gynecologist maybe at least once a year i know a lot of our european counterparts already do that i think the problem we have is we have a system where there is a gp and then the next thing is straight away to a hospital which might be a tertiary teaching hospital uh, like mine um, we are working at setting up community gynae clinics and i think as a as a you know as a as a professional sort of gynecologist uh, through our college and everything we need to push more for those community hubs to improve access um covid's not helped because even for a, a normal gynae clinic appointments in where i work patients have been waiting for months and months uh, mm -hmm. and that's that's not offering any um decent service to our women. Um, so I think more community hubs, more community gynae clinics is the answer. 
Absolutely. And coming back to those women's health hubs, there's one stop clinics. So wouldn't it be fantastic if you could just book on a couple of hours to get it all sorted out rather than have to take four episodes of time off work, um, irritating everybody around you as well. Lots of other interesting questions. Um, uh, a question from Victoria saying how um, after her periods returned for following her second baby, they've been very heavy and dramatically different that she's accepted it. But no, Victoria, I think you should go along to your GP and say, look, this is abnormal. I need to do something. I need to at least go and see somebody or at least have an ultrasound scan. It may be that there's a polyp in the uterus. It may be that there's a, a fibroid. And if it's um, a submucous fibroid, i.e. projecting into the cavity of the womb, it can be really very, very heavy. Um, and then I think another one of the questions that was put to us by Louise earlier uh, in the chat was um, she's been having pain and heavy periods and been told to use a variety of medications, all that could, could be beneficial, tranexamic acid, methanamic acid, or the Mirena coil. Let's come back to the Mirena uh, or the progesterone pill. And she's saying, is this really the only solution medication? Well, I think that uh, often when you've investigated women with heavy menstrual bleeding, you find that there isn't an obvious cause. And that's when we make this diagnosis of dysfunctional uterine bleeding, which I always think is a horrible mouth, mouthful of, of rather upsetting words. But that's what he, the, the, the diagnosis is, DUB. But really, you can only make that after you've excluded all the other things that you can resolve, like the polyp uh, or the fibroids or, or whatever. So important, Louise, I think that you get a, try and get a diagnosis. And then if you can't find any you know, concrete reason that can be treated for the heavy periods, then uh, go back to those medications. And just before I hand over to Varsha and Sujata again, I do think I must give a shout out for the Mirena coil. Um, it's not everybody's cup of tea, but honestly, it has revolutionized gynecology. When I was a junior doctor, really when women presented with a recurrent anemia because they were just hemorrhaging every month, the only option we really had was the combined oral contraceptive pill or a hysterectomy. And now the number of hysterectomies has reduced dramatically because of these Mirena coils. And you can have the coil put in and it's really helpful for reducing the bleeding and also reducing pain. And very few women, not all, but very few women uh, get systemic um, side effects from the progesterone in the coil. So it's absolutely fantastic. So I think um, I want to give a shout out and praise to the, the people that developed the Mirena coil or the equivalents, the JDES and the Viva certain things. Now, Varsha, your turn, I think, to pick up a few of the questions if you can do, if you can see them, or to come up with comments that we've not mentioned so far. Um, I think... Um... There are, there's just been a comment about how um, we may be rather anti-GP and I just wanted to hit that on the head that we're not anti-GP. As gynaecologists we have to work together with our primary care colleagues and this is a situation where we do unfortunately rely on our primary care colleagues because they ultimately have the key without being referred the patients we can't see patients and actually I would love it if our menstrual disorders clinic was inundated with referrals because it just shows and highlights how much work we need to do with the patients with heavy menstrual bleeding. So I just want to say again, we, I'm not anti-GP, um, absolutely love our primary care colleagues, but I think until we work together um, to make sure that we can highlight just how abundantly common this problem is, I don't think the work will be done in terms of the research and the funding that's needed to really push ahead and have the advances within this field. Thank you. And thank you to Jill, who's who's making the comment that she, you, we wouldn't be able to cope in hospitals if we she referred everyone to us. But I really would say then that I think that's a really important point you make, Jill. And let's try and push to get, you know, perhaps the gynecologist to come to you uh, with a portable scanner. All of these things are possible. And I think we need to keep driving it um, to try and make those 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 issues a reality if you think that will be helpful in your practice. So do send me a note in the chat if, if you'd like to comment about that. Um, and yes, there's a question. Um, no, it's not at all uh, naive, Rumnik Kaliri. Um, yes, the contraceptive pill can help with heavy bleeding. It can suppress heavy, heavy bleeding. It doesn't work for everybody, but yes, it can be helpful. Um, Sujata, anything you'd like to add here? Yeah, so it was just on, um, you know, uh, what Jill has mentioned in the chat. Um, so Jill, I have been working on a pathway for community gynae clinics, um, which we want to set up in Manchester 
fairly quickly. Um, the, the, the main drive has been the COVID backlog that we have at the hospital, but having worked very closely with my GP colleagues, I realize the, the, the challenges that GPs face. Uh, the pathways for referral to start with are not very clear. Mm -hmm. I think some of the guidelines that doctors have to follow when they have to refer a patient, um, they could be clearer. So to give you an example, you know, when to do an ultrasound scan, when to examine, when not to examine, should they be referring patients directly for a hysteroscopy clinic? Uh, for, for someone like someone's had menopause, periods have stopped and they've had a bleeding, that's fairly clear. And I would like to stress it to everyone who's on, on, on this webinar today, that if your periods have stopped and if you have a bleeding, you need to be referred urgently to a one-stop clinic. But outside of that, there's a lot of confusion with the guidelines. And I think having worked on setting up community gynae hubs, I'm, I'm fully aware of the challenges and the and the issues around referral to um, to consultants. And I think sometimes delays happen there. And unfortunately, at the end of all of this is a patient who just wants to be seen and treated. So we could have better systems, better pathways and better working together. Thank you. I think there's a question from Gemma um, about the amount of blood that is actually normal to bleed. So um, it's only really sort of in the academic spheres that we quantify the amount of blood that a woman's bleeding with each cycle. So um, as Sujata mentioned, it's really important that it's actually the impact on quality of life um, that matters in terms of when we're saying something is abnormal. Um, so when something is impacting um, how a woman is living or working or her relationships, um, then it becomes an abnormal amount of blood. If we look historically um, and we want to go to those figures of how much quantity, um, we would say anything less than 80 mils. But again, that's arbitrary because some women may bleed 50 mils and that's really too much for them. Um, and so then we'd have to take that seriously anyway. Um, and there are questions surrounding the what's normal when you're on the contraceptive pill. So this varies hugely. So the contraceptive pill, um, the combined contraceptive pill contains both estrogen and progesterone, and that can have an impact on how the brain is sending signals to the ovaries and ultimately that sends signals to the uterus. Um, and so there's a huge range of what's normal with the pill. It could be possible that with the pill, um, the woman takes the pill for 21 days and has a withdrawal bleed for, um, for three, four days or the full seven days, and then goes back on to having the pill again for 21 days. And anything in between to her not bleeding at all when she's taking that pill as well. Um, so it's important to know that when you're taking the pill, it's not a period, it's a withdrawal bleed because your body's not um, producing that. Um, egg and ovulating as it would do normally um, without the pill. Um, and so it's, it's important to know as well that when you're on that suppression with those hormones, if you are having any abnormal or change of your bleeding pattern, that should also be investigated. Because if you were previously not having periods or very light periods, and you're still taking the same pill, and then your periods change, that warrants investigation. Um, so yeah, I think, um, I hope that's answered the question, Rumnik. Thank you. Thank you. So um, anybody, anybody else got any other queries that they want to take? Yes, it is safe to take the pill for many years. Does it have a long term effect on fertility? Ladies, would you like to reply to that? My answer is no, it doesn't. But um, no, it doesn't. I mustn't, I mustn't hog the screen just because I'm sharing. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I think it doesn't. Carly, it doesn't affect have a long term effect on fertility. And in fact, the, the, I would say the combined oral contraceptive pill, if it suits you, has lots of other protective effects as well. Uh, so it's yes, it is safe to take it for many years. It is one of the most thoroughly researched medications on the market. There's nearly 70 years worth of really, really uh, detailed clinical research on the combined oral contraceptive pill. And it's one of the things that I keep hitting the Secretary of State for Health with about trying to get it available over the counter, because when they say, oh, yes, but what if they take oestrogen and they've got some sort of medical problem? And always my response is, and it's funny how the Secretary of State always seems to be a man. Um, but I will say, yes, you know, it's much, much safer for the woman, even if she's got a medical contraindication to be taking the pill than it is for her to become uh, pregnant unexpectedly. And that usually stops them in their tracks. But um, 
uh, hasn't got that over the counter, although we've got the progestogen only pill over the counter now. So that's a big step in the, in, in the right direction. It only took 10 years of campaigning, but uh, uh, I've got energy left, so I shall continue to do the campaigning. Um, let me just see if there's anything else here we could do. Um, there's a magic set of words to use when I do end up in a &E that I'm bleeding heavily. This needs to be something done so I don't get sat with menorrhagia and sent home. Right. So, so several people have put in the chat, several ladies have put in the chat that they've been told they've got menorrhagia and that they need to be and that they're sent home because they presented as an emergency. I think that means that you need to go straight round to your local um, your local doctor and request um, an, a, a referral to um, to to uh, to the gynecologist because and perhaps tell them that you know you, you've been told that you've got menorrhagia and you know that there are things that can be be prescribed that will alleviate that and, and certainly you need some investigation so once again if you had a community gynae clinic with which you could marry up with gps like like um uh, Jill Harling, who's obviously very interested in women's health, I'd love to go and work with her and run a community gynae clinic because I'm sure we'd keep an awful lot of people uh, at home getting on with their lives or on getting on with their work and their families um, and get a lot of satisfaction out of it. Anything else that you want to um, question? The Ranjana is asking, do you recommend endometrial ablation for heavy periods? Sujata, would you like to comment yeah, on that? Yeah. Hi, Ranjana. Yes, of course. So all treatment options we obviously need to look into um the individual circumstances but it's one of the recognized and and extremely effective ways of treating heavy periods uh we need to i mean obviously you know it is specific to um a patient but if all conditions fulfill usually speaking if it's a normal shaped cavity and if there are no contraindications if we are not worried about cancer and things like that we can easily do this done as you know in many centers they'll do it in outpatient setting so you just come in have your treatment go home and you're almost back to doing everything as normal from uh, following day onwards so yes definitely um, an option Okay, and the question we've got, only got two minutes left, but there's a question here from a lady who's been having um, IVF treatment and saying, is it usual for, you know, to change from normal to super heavy bleeding? And of course, when you're undergoing IVF treatment, you're having stimulation, lots and lots of estrogen hormone to um, stimulate the ovaries to um, produce eggs. Uh, or rather drugs to help it produce eggs, which is a lot of oestrogen being released, I should have said. So it may well be that you've developed a slightly overactive womb lining as a result of that. You might have some polyps. So please go along and, and tell uh, your doctor that you've got this heavy bleeding. That's a, it's a dramatic change from how it was before and you'd like to be investigated. So I think I need to bring this towards a close. Um, um, Lena, please advise us. I think we're going to hang on to all of the chat, aren't we? And if you've registered with an email address, we'll try and respond to other questions if we've missed them. Uh, it's quite difficult to be watching the chat and talking uh, at the same time, but we'd, we've all done our very, very best. But Lena's going to capture the chat. And if there are any specific things, we can, we can reply to you, hopefully, by email. It won't be this afternoon necessarily, but we'll try and get that done uh, over the next few days. So can I thank our two fabulous panellists, Sujata Gupta and Varsha Jane. I think you'll agree with me, uh, everyone in the audience, that they've done a super job of normalising a normal problem and making it so accessible for everyone to talk. Um, and I was interested in the first 20 minutes or so, there were, there were no questions, and now they're literally coming flashing past me on the chat. So I think you've really unlocked a conversation. And I very much hope that if we get this sort of response uh, from our audience that we'll be asked to do a similar one again. I mean, I don't think it would harm to do a very similar uh, event such as this, uh, but give it a few months uh, and then we'll, we'll mount it again. So thank you to all of you and thank you to everybody in our audience for attending. Um, you've been super responsive um, and I hope that you've enjoyed it as much as I've enjoyed talking to our two panellists and trying to address some of your questions. So thank you again and thank you to Wellbeing of Women and please log on to our website and come and support us because what we want to do is to make sure that women's health is at the top of everybody's agenda. So thank you and at 1400 hours precisely on the dot I'm going to wish you Goodbye and hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.